If you enjoy the show and want to keep listening in the future, there's a few ways you can give a hand. You can tell your yeah. friends, whoever that may be. Yeah, you can leave us a review and honest, preferably five star rating on Apple Co- Podcasts or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever. Maybe you just listen to it at the library. So leave a review like on the library bulletin board or. Or if you're in like a like a store that sells art supplies just in the pen area where they have the piece of paper where you can test the different kinds of pens. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, and be sure to tag us if you leave one of those. Yeah. Uh, um, also, you can follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. We definitely don't overdo it. And it's always primo content. I try to post, like, fun videos sometimes, dioramas that I make, um, and I don't know. Some other pre- primo content shows up once in a while on Patreon. Did, are you talking about that already? <laughs> oh, I was just talking about, like, the Instagram account, but yeah, the Patreon, oh, yeah. too. Uh, Patreon.com yeah. slash low profile. Yeah. Yeah. And it's there's flexible donations there. They really help cover the expenses for this show, which isn't free to make. Yeah, I it's the I do a lot of research and my research is usually um having to buy records so I can read the liner notes and listen to the whole thing, you know, as it was designed to be heard. And, and if it was designed to be heard on Bandcamp, you know, I do it that way. But um, I buy a lot of music to make this show. So um, whenever possible, that's directly supporting the artist or, you know, whoever's like being in charge of reissuing things and putting work into that. So it's, um, you know, it adds up. And so I try to put some cool stuff on our Patreon. Right. Un- unedited yeah. interviews yeah in, ti- in their entirety yeah not for everything but i i throw something up there once in a while like right now i know we've got like the swamp dog interview in its entirety we'll probably put this one up there at least an extended version of it and then um uh, there's like a mixtape that i made for for christmas and that was really fun uh yeah neat neat stuff if you're into neat stuff and supporting the show but um okay so hi y'all thanks for tuning in to low profile i'm mark lee morrison and this episode is hosted and produced by a good friend of mine who's a founding member of lake the band and has also played with music acts like Baby Island, Laura Veers, Memory Boys, OK Vancouver OK, and First Aid Kit. But he's probably best known as a panelist on this show's episode about the cleaners from Venus. Here he is, direct from Whidbey Island. Let's hear it for Eli Moore. Hi, everybody. So this is your first published interview. Yeah. And I think you just did a fantastic job. I'm really excited to share this with everybody. Um, I learned a lot about the band Negative Land. Or Me too, yeah. Or, I guess not really a band, exactly. I think that, th- think that Mark Hostler said that they prefer, he, he prefers Collective. And he's a founding member of the group. They've been yes. around for over 40 years. Uh, from Northern California originally, or uh, the Bay Area originally, suburbs. Yeah, maybe Concord. Yeah. And they've never slowed down. They've been putting stuff out this whole time. It's really, it's edgy stuff. I mean, there might even be some strong, possibly offensive content on this episode, you know, for sensitive listeners. 
but nothing that's not radio friendly at least yeah um you guys had like sort of a shared connection to fire sign theater who's also another not exactly banned that yeah fire sign theater you know my uncle first told me about them he grew up um listening to their they did kind of like radio skits you know kind of like um prairie home companion or that was my first that was the first kind of association that i that i made mm-hmm. but um david osman one of the members of that group lives here on Woodby island and i share a studio with his son preston so mark and and negative land their their record label sealand records did a release some unreleased fire sign theater material sometime in the last 10 years and um and i guess that was one of the things that everybody in negative land was a huge fan of so and so they're they're like multimedia artists in some way fire sign theater or, or negative land well negative land yes Back to, yeah i i think probably the listeners are wondering well what does this band have to do with the monkeys yeah that is a good the question. rock and roll band yeah. And um, and it turns out they share some similarities. Um, first of all, the common misconception that they don't write their own songs or play their own instruments, which is quite the contrary. Right. Which we learn in this conversation. So they dispel that rumor. And then the other thing they, I guess, sort of have in common with the monkeys is that um, they grew their fan base with a weekly show. Um, Negative Land had a radio show, not a sitcom, but still. It's, you know, you'd have to be blind to miss that one. Yeah, yeah. You might think it was a, radio, a TV show if, if you weren't looking. You, you really might, yeah. And their stuff is catchy. It's shockingly catchy at times. And timely, too. They're, right now, their latest album... Uh, or sister albums, I guess. There's True False and The World Will Decide. Those just came out. Um, you guys talk about that for a little bit. I would think um, right now what I want to do is just let the listeners hear a little bit of one of the singles from that, uh, those sister albums. It's from True False, and this is the song More Data. And... Uh, and uh... As more data becomes available, then we can start doing more with it. Predict. And as we do more with it, me. that creates more data. My algorithmic me. And uh, psychological assessment. And uh, computational inference. And uh, my algorithmic me. And uh, who I am. And as more data becomes more data. As we do more with it, we can start doing more with it. That creates more data. Creates more data. Hi, Mark. Welcome to Low Profile. Why, hello. So you are one of the two founding members of Negative Land? Well, there were three founding members, uh, Richard, David, and I. And Richard died uh, four or five years ago. Uh, Don Joyce uh, uh, started working with us very early on, and Ian Allen. And uh, Don continued to be a crucial part of the Negative Land Brain, Brain Trust. He also died, and as did Ian all uh, in, a, in the last uh, five or six years. So, yes, we've, we've been together so long because we've been doing this for f- over 40 years. Um, you know, we've had members actually uh, no longer with us now. And uh, it's something I kind of realized. I remember many years ago having a conversation with Don where, you know, the group just kind of kept going. And, you know, I, I, I was always sort of sometimes uh, startled by that. You know, that somehow we just kept finding – interesting things to make stuff about and kept being interested in doing more. And, and I remember, I don't know, maybe 15 years ago saying to, uh, to Don, it kind of seems like the group's just going to keep going until enough of us die that there's no one to make this stuff anymore. <laughs> well, the, the group is described as a band sometimes or a multimedia collective. Yeah. I, I think of it as being more of a collect, you can call it whatever you like, but I think of it as being more of a collective and we have, you know, core members, but other members are part of the family, the satellite members that are huge parts of what we do. Or someone like I mentioned, Taylor Jessen earlier, 
who is, the, you know, the Firestein Theater's archivist, and he has been this invaluable help to making these last two records of ours, because after Don, Richard, and Ian all died over the, over the space of a few years, we had, you know, all these hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, of noises and sound bites and, and voice bits going all the way back to the early 80s that had never showed up on any of our studio albums. They'd been used on radio broadcasts because, you know, we have a weekly improvised collage radio show called Over the Edge and use it in our live performances. And we have this stuff all cataloged and stored in, our, in, you know, in, in the archives that were at, were at Don's house. Yeah, so after everyone had died, Taylor was the person who offered to actually digitize all of it. And it took him over a year to do it. There was all so much stuff. And I would just mail him boxes of stuff. He's in Los Angeles. And so as we were working on the pieces for the True False album and then the sequel we made to it of The World Will Decide, we had that material to add to what we were making. And the idea was that we really wanted to have those voices, you know, the, the, that part of who we are. Because I think what makes Negative Land Negative Land is all these different strange brains all working together. And so even though some of those brains now are no longer breathing, we could still work with them in ways that really felt like they just went down the hall to use the toilet and they were going to come back in a minute. And we would just say, oh, look, you know, Ian or Don, look, we just dropped this, this bit of yours into this piece. What do you think of it? It didn't change how we operated that much, the fact that they were all dead, <laughs> so, which is maybe a strange thing to say, but it's, yeah, it's, it's true. So. I've been researching these two albums, these sister albums, and I was interested to see that every participant was credited as being part of the composition, the performance, the production, the recording, the mixing, and the editing, which is unusual in a quote-unquote band or yeah. collective. There's usually more of a division of, of labor, you know, the drummer and the, yes. the person who's more of a recording yeah. nerd and or... Go well, ahead. I should mention, though, that we, we actually stopped saying who was in the group in 1989 uh, or 88, somewhere in there. The last record where we really said who everyone was in the group was Escape from Noise in 1987. And the only reason we said who everyone was on these last two albums is that, I mean, it, it, it kind of broke our rule because we just we literally haven't said it. We don't say who does what of in anything. My name's not on any of our records after, you know, starting in my, maybe 89 or so. But um, uh, for, I mean, for example, I mean, all, all of our names are not on them. But for these last two records, because we'd had members actually pass away, we felt that we wanted people who follow our work enough and who do know all the names of everybody. We wanted to make it clear that those people were very much a part of this record, even if they weren't no longer with us. So that's why, they're, that's why the, the names are all listed, is to uh, it's to honor their contributions and their memories really and that's why it says negative land was slash is right that's a way of kind of ob obliquely referencing the fact that uh not everybody listed on the, on the record is actually still alive so would you mind talking through how a song might be built with so many different roles yeah sure yeah i think i could kind of in a i'm gen generalize but be, but one of the great things about our weekly radio show is that it, it, it is what it is. And, it, of course, you, you may or may not know that we now have over 4,000 hours of the last 35 years of shows are up on the Internet Archive. Is that at archive.org? Yes. Yeah. Cool. But – the, the radio show, you know, it is what it is. It is its own thing, but it also acts as a kind of a laboratory for us to play around with material and ideas because, because it, you, you were mentioning earlier, you know, our albums, most of them are concept albums. Well, so are our radio shows. There would be a theme every week to the Over the Edge radio show that would get picked. And so after the shows were done, the art material would be all archived, and that's why we had so much material. And, uh, you know, I should say it was all analog. This was all analog tapes, cassettes and reel-to-reels, you know, going back to the early 80s. Anyway, we would do these thematically based shows, and oftentimes we'd kind of make a mental note, you know, about, oh, that that show we did about guns, yeah, there's there's a lot of good material there. M maybe that could be something, or maybe that could at least, that could turn into a live performance piece we do on stage. Or And, and so it's kind of like it was a weird way of workshopping material 
And as the years went by, you know, we'd kind of keep notes and end up with enough of it that would start to hang together. Uh, and, and we realized, well, there's a piece there. You know, we may not, we don't know exactly how it's going to come together, but we know, you know, there's enough, like, the, the, on the new album is a track called Failure. You know, that that's drawing upon material that goes back, I don't know, 10 or more years that all connect to ideals of failure and uh, things that David in the group, David Wills, has said about it and uh, tapes that we have. And there was just enough there that it seemed like like, that could come come together into a piece, for sure. I was wrong. Uh, the album we made in 1997 called Dyspepsy, which is on the surface all about – every track is about Pepsi and Coke and the Cola Wars and all that. But it's it's really a project that's all about advertising, the impact of advertising on, on all of us. We've been wanting to make something about advertising for years and years and years, but we just couldn't find a, a way into it that we found was interesting to us creatively and had a hook to it that we just kind of thought was was intriguing until one day we realized that we had amassed a rather large amount of material in our archives that all connected to Pepsi and people who made it, people who made the commercials, uh, again, the, you know, Coke versus Pepsi, Cola Wars, you know, we just had all this stuff connected to Pepsi. And, you know, there was a point where I think I said, I said, wait, what if, what if the way we do an album, it's, it's really all about advertising, but the way we approach it is we make, a, we make the most relentless product placement record thing ever made, you know, <laughs> where every single track on this record is going to be somehow or other about Pepsi. When 7-Up has got me down, when high C gets me low, my Lubbock's blue ain't blue, it's brown. My Nestle's quick just makes me slow. When my sparkling cider's lost its shine, my can of sharks is dull. Hawaiian punch has knocked me cold. A feeling hits my skull. And my mind just turns to Pepsi and I couldn't tell you why. Smart drinks leave you know, we don't do stuff to be stirring just to be stirring. You know, we are trying to make things that we think, we hope hold up over the years as an actual work, you know, of audio art in some way. And so that sort of aha moment idea you know of uh, for a con- concept album took us about three years to actually make it because of course we it has to develop in an organic way and i think that's true of all of our pieces that that we do is that they 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 can be gestating for a very long time and so when they come together there's something that feels very natural and organic about it so i i i, I we because we really try hard to make sure our work doesn't sound you know, contrived or, or didactic. Um, I don't know if we succeed in that, but we try. You know, that's certainly on our mind, you know, all the time. And so having work appear and, and get created in a very organic sort of way, I think is helpful with, it, with that goal. I wrote in my notes the word didactic with a question mark because I was curious if that was something you, you guys were consciously avoiding or trying to teach, you know. And maybe I thought of teaching because I first became familiar with your work in college. Neat. Yeah, right. Well, you said that I actually spoke to a class of yours a long time ago. I don't – which I slightly remember doing. We watched Sonic Outlaws, a documentary that is about negative land and appropriation of – That I think that was just shortly after I moved away from Olympia because uh, something that uh, uh, people may not know is I lived in Olympia, Washington from 1990 to 2003. Well, I didn't realize it was that long of a period of time. 
Yes, I feel like I, I, in seeing the ways Olympia has changed since I've gone back over the years, I feel like I lived through a very incredibly wonderful period of creativity and incredible just do-it-yourself energy, just all kinds of re- really amazing underground culture stuff going on all the time. Did you guys ever play one of the international pop festivals? Well, actually, early on, right after I moved there, I ended up performing. I did a trio with Steve Fisk, who's a musician and a music producer in the Northwest, who, um, and Bob Bassanich. And we were in part of the International Pop Underground Festival that Calvin Johnson organized. And then in 1999, Negative Land actually played at the Yo-Yo Agogo Festival, you know, that Pat Malley and all of his crew um, uh, organized. And that was really thrilling. And we played in the Capitol Theater and it was, com- you know, completely packed. And de- we definitely were doing something that was really, really outside of what was going on in the rest of that festival. Very different what we were doing. You know, because we had all of our film projectors and costumes and puppet show, and you know, it was it was a big production. Do you remember how long your set was? Oh yes, it was a it was about three hours with <laughs> intermission total. <laughs> cool. Yeah, it was about an hour long set, and an hour hour and hour and twenty, and then there was intermission, and then an hour long set. Yeah, it was it was an epic, exhausting thing, and that actually turned into a tour that we called true false in 2000. Um, and, uh, we ended up touring the whole country. Uh, we played about, I don't know, 25 to 30 shows all over the U S in, um, and that was, that show was kind of a test drive of the whole thing. You know, we were just starting out getting it all working up, working. How long has the band been operating remotely and how does that work as a collective project? Well, we all, you know, the whole, we all ended up, we met in the suburbs of uh, Northern California, you know, in 78 and uh, put out our first little record in 1980. I was still in high school. Uh, Don and Ian lived in the Bay. Yeah, everyone lived in the Bay Area. And that's very much, you know, that's where, where it formed. And, and I kind of think, I can't really imagine a negative land forming anywhere else, <laughs> really. And at some point I decided I just wasn't cut out for uh, being a poor, struggling, you know, starving artist living in the urban environment. And I ended up moving to Olympia in Washington in 1980. Not not so much to be there. It was more to not be in California. How did you guys continue to work? Did you get together occasionally or did you go use the mail or, you know, how did, how did the... Well, by that point, Don Joyce and our studio was in Oakland, California. And so I would... I would go down there on the bus or and then eventually Southwest Airlines started offering really cheap flights. So I was going, I was going down there, I don't know, four or five times a year and my parents still lived there so I could stay with them. So it worked out fine. It's very rare that negative land would go into the studio and record like a band all playing together. Right. Mm-hmm. We have done that, but it's very, very rare. Mostly, even when we, from the first record on, it's mostly a, one or two of us working together to get things to a certain point and then playing it for other members of the group who then go in this on their own and then they add stuff to it. You know, it's because it's incredibly laborious to make the stuff that we do and you're kind of composing it as you're creating it, you know? So it's not like you went off and wrote the chords to a song and you kind of have it worked out. And you can record it. You're sort of discovering what the piece is as you're making the piece, which which in our case means spending, you know, gazillions of hours just working with the tape deck back and forth and a razor blade or playing around with some synthesizer or some strange effect processor. It doesn't really work to even do that with other people in the room. Right. <laughs> you would drive each other insane. Yeah. So. Yeah, so it'd be, even when we all lived together, when we were making a, a, the album Escape from Noise, we actually did all live together. And so, but uh, but it would mostly be one at a time. We'd be in the studio, which was in the living room, and uh, you know we'd just go in there and play stuff for each other, and then say, "Okay, I'm going to go in for I'm going to go in today, and I'm going to try to add to what you just did." So then, when we started living in different places, the process became a, you know a little more complicated, but it wasn't that much different. And I could send tapes that I'd been working on in Olympia down to Don. He mm-hmm. could dub. You know, uh, in that case, I would send it would be a DAT tape. Nobody uses that format anymore. 
But I'd send that down and then, you know, they'd add, you know, everyone else down there would add stuff to it and send back some rough mixes for me to hear. And then I would go down to California to work on it more. And then and then when we actually did the mixing, that would require three or four of us in the studio at once because it would require at least six arms <laughs> to, to do all the mixing and fading moves. And we usually could only mix about a minute at a time because there were so many, it was so complicated to do. Yeah, there's a really good scene in Sonic Outlaws of you guys talking over who stands where so they can reach this knob. And That's very accurate about what how what it was like when we were mixing. You stand there and wait, because I have to reach my arm over to here and I got to go under. And you'd literally, you'd rehearse it like you're rehearsing a choreographed, you know, dance performance. And we'd have to figure out an edit point where we could start the next 45 seconds or minute, you know, and edit it all together. Uh yeah. Then once computers come around, then you start to be able to, you know, automate everything. And it's, you know, it's utter, it's a completely different ball game. There's an amazing piece on the first Negative Land record. There's no titles, but it's the 15th song. I don't know if you remember that one, but it, it's a panning piece. That's really great. You're asking about that track. If it's the one I'm thinking of, it's the mixing console we had. And it's all the channels of the mixer, and every channel has a sound on it, or a tape playing, or a tape loop, or a radio noise. And the piece, the performance of the piece is simply taking the fader, each fader, and panning one down and one up as fast as you can. So it's... It kind of ended up being like an early for a you know a nascent form of doing some crazy sampling composition. Of course, some of the some of the sources were cassette tape mixes of things, so some of the things kept changing all the time. It's actually very easy what we did, but it it certainly didn't sound like anything I'd ever heard when we did it. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't think I've heard anything quite like that. Nice. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's what you know. That's what motivated us to make that first record, and it's what motivates us to this day. Is that we're, you know, we're trying our darndest to make things that don't sound like anything we've ever heard. And you know, we everyone in, in Negative Land loves every kind of music you can imagine. You know, we're all super super music fans but but our what we're interested in creating is is something that doesn't sound like any of the records we own you know that's what the, what energized us when we were first making that that first record is hearing all kinds of an incredible unusual experimental and and avant-garde rock and pop coming out in the late 70s but there was there was something that we wanted to hear that we just couldn't find and at some point we just realized well we're going to make that record and I should also add that I am currently in the middle of working on reissuing the very first Negative Land album as a limited edition uh, vinyl record with handmade record covers exactly the way we made them uh, in the eight, you know early 80s. You're going to have each cover be a unique piece of art. Yeah. We ended up making, over the years, we made 9,000 unique, one-of-a-kind record front and back covers of the vinyl version of our first record and we made 6,000 of the cd version so there's 15,000 one-of-a-kind versions of our, the first negative land album out in the world there and i wish i could prove it because i always thought we could maybe you know there's we've set some world record or something but um richard and i were planning you know this was before he died we were we were planning to do a reissue because after don died we found the master tapes of the first album which we thought were lost so we've remastered that, and we've got some hopefully some some interesting bonus deluxe goodies to come with it. And then I've I've already cut up a thousand uh, wallpaper samples for the back cover, and and Richard had cut up many hundreds of photos, uh, and he was even he was actually cutting up pictures for this reissue more or less on his deathbed. He was doing it up until maybe the, a week or two before he died, of you know he had cancer. And uh, so I, I did prom you know, I promised him I'd finish the project, but it's a lot of work because I have to cut up another two thousand images out of old uh, home improvement magazines from the late fifties and early sixties to make these things. So the labor is is insane. <laughs> On that record and points, which I previously thought was your first record, right. just because that was the first one I found in. Um, it seems like there's 
maybe a little bit more kind of fiddling with actual instruments than became normal as you guys progressed. Would you agree with that or? No, I wouldn't agree with that at all. Okay. But I can hear what I know people often think that, you know, we got a lot of attention, obviously, for sampling some music from another very famous rock band. That's the letter U and the New World 2. The four-man band features Adam Clayton on bass, Larry Mullen on drums, Dave Evans, nicknamed The Edge on... This is bullshit. Nobody cares. These guys are from England, and who gives a shit? Oh, yeah. Just a lot of wasted names that don't mean diddly shit. Oh, yeah, for sure, for sure. You know, all the attention that we got over the U2 single, I think, understandably created an impression that we sample from other people's music a lot. And we do sample from other people's music some, but a lot of the music over, on our records over the years actually is stuff that we played. You know, we, we composed it and we played it. And actually, I think that creating music by sampling other people's music has become so widespread that these last two albums we made, we completely stopped doing that. We're just not that interested in it anymore. You never know, could come back around uh, again, but... These last two albums, we definitely were exploring fully creating albums out of music that we wrote and performed ourselves. And I think that uh, particularly, um, I, you know, a, a lot of credit should go to, to John Lidecker in, in the group. He, he, I think, brought a somewhat more, I don't know how to put it exactly, because I don't, I don't know music terms very well, but he just brought an extra kind of harmonic, melodic, something to what we were doing you know added some more of the black keys <laughs> just yeah he's he's just brought something that that kind of emotionally modulated the music that w on these records in a way that felt like a, a real progression for negative land in a way that i was very very excited about would you be able to talk a little bit about the very early formation of the band like meeting richard and and don and and david and um maybe the scene that you guys came up in well there was a scene but we certainly felt like we weren't any part of it at all we were a bunch of nerdy suburban kids and we looked like it and when we started connecting a little bit to sort of the punk rock and avant-garde rock and music world in the greater bay area we experienced a lot of what, you know, I don't know what really was going on, but at that time and at that age, it felt like a lot of elitism and snobbery, you know, and we certainly weren't dressed the right way, you know. Mm -hmm. I was still wearing, you know, <clears throat> bell-bottom corduroys and plaid shirts and had long hair. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. um, and being that we were, we were from the suburbs and there seemed to me a, a, a lot of animosity toward the, the suburbs coming from the big cities. Uh, it was you really felt like people just looked down their nose at it, even though I think I do think a lot of the people in the the sort of underground music scene in San Francisco, what they really were, were people who had escaped the suburbs and they were they were perhaps embarrassed about it or just didn't want to talk about it. But that's where they were really from. But by the time we made our first concept album in 1983, A Big Ten Eight Place, that record is very loudly and proudly kind of wearing our, our suburban origins on its sleeve. I mean, that's what the whole record is about. Like, hey, we're from this really, supposedly really banal, boring, awful, brain dead part of the country, and and you know, and 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 we're not ashamed of it. <laughs> Too long of a story to go into, but you know, I I had a job working after school, uh, calling people up uh, at home on the phone to ask them questions about their favorite TV shows. That was my after school job, and that's where I'm. That's where the members, the early members of Negative Land, all met. We were all working there, hmm. and. Uh, uh, realized we we had you know we had some common interests in in strange and unusual music and and making noises ourselves and recording and we just started hanging out with each other and and recording stuff and uh, within you know within the space of about a year and a half we'd we'd figured out that we wanted to put together material to make a record album um, and get that out there to and sell it to the one or two stores in the Bay Area that we thought would sell our music. You know, then we got discovered by a local underground record distributor. It was called Systematic Distribution. And uh, they picked up our stuff. And all of a sudden, you know, the 500 records we'd made by hand that we thought might sell a few hundred of them over the next five or six years, suddenly those 500 were gone within two months. I think we all had the sense that we, that was it. We were done, you know. 
and we did it. You know, we managed to make a record, you mm-hmm. know, and not, you know, when we're still teenagers. And, um, and then suddenly the records have sold out. The stores and distributors want more. And we're getting calls from, a, a, you know, a music venue in San Francisco that assumes incorrectly that because we are, quote, a band, unquote, that we have a set that we can do. And they invite us to perform. And we've never performed ever. We couldn't perform what was on our records in any way, shape or form. You know, I mean, imagine back then mm-hmm. compared to now what you can do with, with tiny you know, modular synthesizers and software based stuff and laptops. And, you know, it's, you know, you can just take an entire recording studio literally onto, onto your stage with you to pull that off. We just started improvising with the gear we had and tried to come up with things that we could do live. So from the very first negative land performance, we were never trying to duplicate our records. And that has remained true to this very day. We mostly are interested in approaching live performance as its own unique medium. What can we do? We're very interested in it being very, very live. We don't want to have lots of backing tracks. We don't want to have sequencers running. We don't want to cheat very much with all the risks inherent in bringing a bunch of strange gear on stage, you know, that kind of precariousness that it could all fall apart. And once we started doing radio shows, of course, we also were approaching radio as well, it's its own medium. What do we do? What do we do with radio? What can you do in radio that you can't do on a record and you can't do on stage? Well, there's lots you can do because you kind of use the theater of the mind and imagination and the fact that people are only listening to you can't they can't uh, see you, but you can take live callers on the air and have the audience, the listeners interact with you. So there's all kinds of cool, unusual stuff you can do. So I don't know if that kind of answers your question, but but we, yeah, we never really, we, we absolutely felt very outsidery to to any kind of scene that was going on in, in the Bay Area, you know, really f- for years and years and years and years. So. Eventually, you guys ended up getting another label interested in, in releasing your music, SST. Yes. We put out our first three albums ourselves, which was an incredibly great learning curve. And one thing we realized was that we hated running a record label. It was awful. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's just dreary. And and I can say that now is, um, we we obviously we went back to running our record label after we were sued over the U2 record and after our own label SST sued us all in the early 90s, and yeah I don't we don't enjoy running a record label but it's kind of just a necessary evil, of, it's what you got to do if you want to put out your music, in an uncompromised fashion. So we yeah we realized that we we would we were wondering is there a label out there that we could work with that would res- you know, respect our, our autonomy and entrust us to do what we're going to do and not try to alter or change what we're doing and just let us do our thing and it works in an underground kind of alternative way that we can get behind kind of morally, philosophically, and ethically. And, and SSC Records, even though they were mostly known as being a punk label, th- they were starting to diversify a little bit in what they put out. And we thought that might be a possibility. And, uh, um, and a, the the a guy who named Ray Farrell, who used to work at the one record store in the Bay Area of the two that would sell our records in the early days, um, he had moved to L.A. to work for SST. So we had a connection there. And we ended up sending a cassette down of the album we were working on, which was Escape from Noise, um, you know, just to see if maybe there might be some interest. So, And there was. Three, two, one, zero! It's the first time. And yeah, Car Bomb, that was uh, Don's vocal debut. He's he's screaming so loud and so hard that we could only do one take a day for each verse, you know? And we put a little piece of tape on the floor of where he was going to stand. We left the microphone. You know, we had to get everything all set up in the, so that we could return to it each day. But the idea was that he was just going to absolutely, you know, give his all a thousand percent and kind of blow his voice out. And and then we would just get yeah we'd get through one one of the verses and then the next day we do the next one. <laughs> it was pretty funny. 
I wish there was video of it. It would be it would be fantastic. Did Don sing, um, quote unquote, sing? Um, I didn't know I was dead from the new album. No, that's Richard speaking, and okay. and uh, yeah, and Richard is also uh, the voice you hear on True False on the track called Yesterday Hates Today. And both of those recordings were discovered on Richard's hard drive after he died. Wow. Yeah. And so that those are those were things that we didn't even know he had made and we thought they were absolutely brilliant and and kind of very eerie and spooky, particularly the one you just mentioned. Uh, because, you know, if so for anyone who knows our work well enough to recognize his voice and know that he is someone who is in fact dead. And that's the one who's saying, I didn't know I was dead on the track. And the, the Yesterday Hates Today, um, at the, when he recorded that, Richard's cancer was in his brain and it was affecting his speech. And so there's a whole bunch of takes. I mean, it was heartbreaking to hear it. Um, he's doing take after take after take because he's trying to get through the, 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 uh, basically the brain cancer is causing his speech to slur and make him sound almost like he's drunk. And so, um, we actually had to go through all of the takes and see if there was enough takes of each line that we could edit together a final take where he sounded like himself or like his old self. And, and we were able to do that. But we were very pleased to get to have him be on the on both of the records in that sort of strong kind of way. For me, the first song that really drew me in on on the world will decide your your newest album was "I Didn't Know I Was Dead." Yeah, there's always one track that kind of hooks you, and then you, it enables you to explore the rest of the record. You mentioned earlier the album "A Big Ten Eight Place." Yes, I really like that record, and there's something about the way it it hits right right at the top that really got me in there. Like the first song, it's called "A Theme from a Big Tenny Place." Yes. Do you, Do you want to talk about the making of that song? Oh, sure. It's interesting. I don't. I don't actually. It's very. Believe it or not, it's very rare that we get asked about very specific questions about tracks. Like so, yeah, it's fun to talk about. Um, yeah, the drumming on that is is actually Ian Allen's brother Pike. And I played him some Noi albums, and I said, drum like that. <laughs> I like Concord and 180G. I like Pleasant Hill. No other possibility. Very stupid, very stupid, very stupid, very stupid. Of course, that's uh, the weatherman, David Wills, doing the vocals. And um, that's an ARP Odyssey synthesizer playing the little melody in there. The, and the bass, boom, 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 is also the ARP Odyssey synthesizer. And that was all done on a, on a four track. I think when we were mixing the piece down, I think we had to play some of the parts live and then even do the fade out live and everything. Mm -hmm. I think the only thing we've ever made that really approaches it, in a, not, con not conceptually, but sonically, is if you listen to uh, Death Sentences of a Polished and Structurally Weak, which came out in 2001 or two, 2002, I think. And that, to me, actually kind of sonically feels a bit like a Big Ten A place. Yeah, I have a physical copy of that one, and, and it comes with a book of found letters yeah. from demolished cars. Yes, so things found in automotive wrecking in wrecked cars and automotive wrecking yards, and yeah, and I actually years later got to meet uh, Davy Rothbard of Found Magazine, and he he told me that 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 project inspired him to uh, it gave him the idea to start Found Magazine. Wow, yeah, which was you know very 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 exciting to find out because I because I Found Magazine's fantastic. I love it. For maybe the last twenty years, you guys have been working non-linearly on computers. I'm I'm assuming. Yeah. So it might be a tired question, but I'm always curious to hear people's take on making that transition and how they like digital versus analog. There's a lot of things about it I I hate because when you're working digitally to make music, you're staring at a computer monitor, lifting your finger up and down. That's what you're doing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's it's 
there's something about the, the physicality of working with instruments and tape. You know, in our case, when we're cutting up tape, you're literally pulling reels of tape off the wall and unspooling tape and, and putting the, the, you know, physically cutting the tape. I mean, the sound literally is physical, right? And there was something about that that I really miss. I really, really did like that. The, but because of the way we're interested in assembling sounds and noises and, 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 and moving them around, the fact that it, we went into this non-destructive medium where you can get in, down to a microscopic level of how you move your sounds around has been an amazing tool. We've been able, because, of, you know, because we're using computers, you're able to go into a voice phrase that we're using and you're able to put in insert, you know, a quarter of a second, a half second, you know, or just a tiniest little bit in between words in a sentence so that you can make a sentence that much more precisely, rhythmically fall on uh, the rhythms of the music, the cadence of how the person is speaking, you know, and we're, and we're very, you know, when we pick these voices we use, of course, we're picking them because of what they're saying, but we're always picking them because of how they're saying it. Something about their voice has an interesting timbre to it, a quality. Something about the cadence of how they speak, you know, is 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 interesting to us, and is musical to our ear. So the so the digital technology has allowed us to kind of that much more microscopically align the voices. And I hear it when I listen to these last two records, and and the credit really goes to John for for getting really really good at this. And that's John. Lidecker, who also works in the name Wobbly. He's also a solo artist under the name Wobbly. And um, yeah, he he just got so good at nudging things around just at the, at the most microscopic level. But I really hear it. And I really hear that there's a flow if you, to, to these tracks of how the, 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 the spoken word is kind of musically enmeshed into the music. Yeah, it seems like uh, uh, these last two seem like records that that are informed by the technology that that they were created by. They're 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 created. You know, we're using all of our sound collage tricks to make these records. But to me, you know, they're absolutely music. They're songs. We call them songs. We do we don't refer to it lately. We haven't been referring to any of this stuff as pieces or tracks or compositions. We just think of them as songs. All of them. Yeah, I agree. In um, Escape to Noise, there's the song Christianity is Stupid, which which seems to be doing the same kind of thing, but I'm, I'm assuming in order to get this preacher to say Christianity is Stupid, you had to use tape to, to literally cut those words together. Oh, no. No, not no. And precisely the opposite. The entire reason we were inspired to use him saying it is because that's what he said. Christianity is stupid. 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 Communism is good. Communism is good. Communism is good. Communism is good. Can you hear that? Give up. Can you hear that? It's how he said it, you know. He's not saying Christianity is stupid. You know, he's saying Christianity is stupid. You know, give up. Give up. Communism is good. You know, it's very, very musical. He instantly, it instantly spoke to us as, hey, this guy's the vocalist for a song. You know, let's let's make him the singer. It brings to mind these new um, Kenneth Copeland mashup. He's another popular preacher right now. Have you seen any of that? Oh, yes. Yeah. That guy, that guy is, is, uh, is unique. It's what you guys were doing, you know, 30, yes. years, 30 years ago. Or the Ron Baker edits. Have you seen those by by Vic Berger? Yes. Oh, yeah. No, that stuff's that stuff's genius. Brilliant stuff. Fantastic. Yeah, and that's also why we haven't touched preachers in a long time. You know, right. just it became an area that, like, okay, a lot of other people are doing stuff. That's fine. 
Do you want to talk at all about the U2 project or has that been covered? Yeah, I mean, I, I'll talk about anything you want to talk about, but it's, it's uh, yeah, I mean, I've probably done about 500 interviews and I've done a hundred, you know, I've done 140 lectures about the history of our work and every hit and each one, I've certainly had to tell the whole U2 story. So I've gotten good at it. And, uh, well, one of the concepts that I learned while seeing you speak back in 2003 was this idea that um, we're constantly being bombarded by popular culture. Whether or not you want to, we've heard all the U2 songs and we've heard I Still Haven't Found What I'm Looking For 500 times per person. We're making music and sound collage about the world that we live in. And the world that we live in isn't just sky, clouds, birds, trees. It's media. You know, it's advertisements, it's it's information coming at us from everywhere. And it's certainly pop songs playing where, whether we want to hear them or not. And so to me, to us, you know, you too is as much a part of the environment as a, as, a, as a bird is or a tree. And so we're just we're making stuff that's that's about and reacting to this this environment we did not choose to live in. I don't like driving down the road and seeing billboards everywhere we go. I think they're ugly, you know, but it's it's a it's a fact of of uh, uh, it's an un unfortunate fact of of uh, modern capitalist life in, in the, the Western world um, that people who, who have more money than you can make these gigantic, ugly, loud, screamy things that are in your face and that your brain reads them. If you can if you can read English you read a billboard whether you think you don't you do or you don't. I mean, you if you if it if you see it, you you've taken it in. No matter how much you might think you're not affected by advertising, believe me, you are. You know, there's nobody who isn't. I mean, I think it's foolish to people who think that somehow, yeah, they they're above that. Um, you know, I think from an odd, from a sonic standpoint, I really think it's a, one of our best projects we've ever done. And then the packaging, which was designed wor working with a designer in Olympia, Washington, trying to bring it back to that Randall Hunting, he was the one who suggested the idea that we make the U2 really big, <laughs> negative land small. He just was kind of playing around on his computer, you know, like, well, what about this? I don't know. What about this? And he said, I don't know. You could do that. And I and I was sitting next to him, and I'm going, "Oh my God, that's amazing! Yes, we got to do that," because there was something that was so exciting, uh, you know, going back to, you know, I don't know, hearing that first that that Noi Two album, you know, where you're hearing something that feels like that shouldn't be done. You can do that. There was something about, yeah, we're going to make a record that looks like it is something that it actually isn't, and we're going to do it, and and we're going to put it in a record store, and and yes, it might be confusing, even though. I, we certainly thought that because record stores were getting them from distributors that only carried independent underground music and the fact that it was on SST records, we all thought, look, people are going to figure out that this isn't U2. We didn't think anyone would actually be dumb enough and inattentive enough to buy it. Yeah. Well, it absolutely, you know, it, 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 it was an inflection point for us as people and for us as a group. I ended up starting to get asked to do all these lectures all over the place, starting in the in the late '90s. I spent about 10, 15 years where I, um, I about once a month I was going out and doing some lecture somewhere about our work, and that all happened because in the wake of the U2 lawsuit, we kind of emerged as inadvertent spokespeople for a different perspective on art and copyright law, and kind of the changing fabric of how we live and, and what reality is like now for us in a, in a world where we're, you know, bombarded and just saturated with media and information and cult, pop culture. We knew it was, a, it was a risk doing it. We underestimated how much of a risk it was, but we, we knew it was a risk. I think we thought at most that U2's record label would send us a scary letter just slapping our wrist and saying, you should withdraw this or, or we're going to actually go after you. And then we could decide what to do next. But that's not what happened. The release of the U2 record was delayed quite a few times for just, no, you know, I don't know why, just somehow the, the release schedule, the SST had, it got delayed you know, like three or four times. By the time it came out, just, and this really was by sheer luck, it happened to come out a month before the release of a new U2 album. Hmm. And back then, Record labels would release singles in advance of a new record. You would release a 12-inch single in advance of a, of a new album. So the timing was it looked like it really did sort of position itself that way without meaning to. It was perfect. I mean, it, was, it, was, it was like it couldn't have been more you know, genius if, you know, 
if we'd have been allowed to plan it that way. It was just it was just fantastic. When they found out about it, they just wanted to just destroy it and make it, you know, vanish from the face of the earth. They did not want to send to send us a little scary letter. So the first thing we heard about it was a huge lawsuit, you know. Hmm. So they'd already at that point spent probably twenty five grand just preparing the lawsuit. <laughs> so the momentum, you know, this juggernaut that was then coming down on us was already, you know, fully in motion. The wonderful thing about that lawsuit was that it, it, it caused us all to to really have to more deeply examine what we were doing creatively and what it really meant and what we were willing what risk we were willing to take going forward. The math of it wasn't about was it worth it or not. It was just it was a good project. We did it. You know, it spoke to us. We put it out there. What happened was unexpected, but once what happened happened, we realized well. We can use this as a sort of a teachable moment, and we can turn this into more of the art project. You know, this now it turns out that the release of the album is just the beginning of a much larger conceptual art project. Well, and the other thing that was covered in in the film Sonic Outlaws was the idea of the folk tradition. You know, like someone like the Carter family would be performing songs or changing them, and it wasn't a criminal act. The idea that an idea is property is really new. If you really think about it, it's an incredibly strange idea. It's, 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 you know, it's not natural. <laughs> it's just weird. The idea that you have people who can own ideas that are called corporations and that we've decided as a, as a society that corporations somehow are legally persons, which is of course insane. But that's what we've actually done. So, but a corporation is a person, but it is a person that can't go to jail, can't give it the death penalty. It can't really be punished in the same way you'd punish an individual for a crime. And a corporation is immortal. So it's not like a human being at all. It's like an alien invasion, right? That we will, we brought upon ourselves willingly. It reminds me of a thought that I I had one time, you know, like in the Old Testament, they have the commandment, thou shalt not like the idea of idolatry. I was thinking that the idea of corporate personhood, you know, you could make a connection between that commandment and giving a corporation life-like qualities and, and essentially paying homage to it. It's very problematic. And the other thing I, I just realized I should have added was that we have a technology now where these, these quote-unquote ideas can be duplicated for zero cost. So it's, you know, if you have a bicycle and you're riding a bicycle, you know, to the Olympia Food Co-op and, and you leave it outside and I steal your bicycle, you don't have a bicycle anymore. And you're, you may be in trouble. You may be really stuck. But if I have a bicycle copier and I come up to your bike and I aim it at your bike and I go, I just made a copy of Elijah's bike. <laughs> and, and, and then I go ride off in it. Well, you're fine. You still have your bike. There's no problem, right? <laughs> Basically, once we entered into the digital world where you could duplicate ideas electronically, it didn't work with the way we were practicing capitalism, you know, which is based on a limited supply chain and scarcity. You know, so yeah, it doesn't it doesn't work at all. So inst but instead of taking that as an opportunity to rethink how we how we do this, we what we're trying to do, of course, is just you know smash a a square peg into a round hole, you know, but it's never going to, it's never going to work. I still think it would be fun to talk to a robot. You mean you'd forget it was a robot? Hey, we need to talk. I found myself deeply missing. Well, you strike me as a positive force in the world. Well, thank you. But we're in such a negative land. All the all the more reason why it's important. I honestly, I think that the, the, the we you know as 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 much as we we deal with dark subject matter in our records, the place that we're coming from is we're, we're dealing with the stuff because we actually do have hope. And that that answers kind of a, a hovering question I've had is. What is the force that keeps Negative Land making records for 41 years? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. But maybe, you know, that's, that's, that's part of it. Part of it. But, 
yeah, it's but it's you know things are bleak out there. The the, the, plan, the climate of the planet is collapsing. America as a civilization is in serious decline, and it's unstoppable. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks, Mark. This has been really cool. Uh, thanks for talking to me at Low Profile. Well, thank you. Well, you're welcome. Well, it was a pleasure talking with you. <laughs> Where can people learn more about Negative Land? Oh, you know, we're out there in the in the in the the Facebook, Twitter, Instagram world. Probably the, mostly actively updating on what we're doing on our Facebook page. But uh, you know, we have a, and we have a website, and we're total. You know. We run everything ourselves. Is there a song from The World Will Decide that you'd like to go out on? You know, the one I was thinking of is, 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 from, uh, is from the prequel to The World Will Decide, True False, the track, This Is Not Normal. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you. Good talking to you. Bye-bye. Yeah. You must understand the meaning of any facts you wish to remember. Eli, thank you so much for doing this episode. I know it was a lot of work, and I hope it was really fun. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, I think it gave me kind of a... It made me feel like I was in college again, in, in a good way. You know, at times there was the stress, but also the, the satisfaction of, of finishing my homework on time with a couple extensions. Well, um, Eli's going to be back later on this season so stay tuned 
Thanks again, Eli. And Thank you. Good, good night, everybody. Good night. Bye-bye.